Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Dave and you're the audience. Go ahead Crossing State Historic Site welcomes you to this program being offered by the Canal Society of New Jersey about the Morris Canal. And with us this evening is, is Tim Roth, who is the Vice President and Board Member of the Canal Society of New Jersey. In addition to providing interpretive services for the society, he manages all of the electronic communications, including email, the website, and social media for the dissemination of information about the Canal Society and its responsibility for their marketing. And he is, he is responsible for their marketing and promotion. Tim manages and coordinates volunteers for such great events as the Canal Heritage Days and the Canal Society Museum in Morristown, New Jersey. Formerly a systems analyst and program manager for a large Fortune 500 company, Tim now provides valuable resources to the Canal Society of New Jersey, and we are fortunate enough to have him here with us this evening to discuss the Morris Canal. So please, Tim, thank you very much. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself and please take it away. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for having us here. Thank you all for joining us. Um, before I start, just let me say that uh, at our last program meeting in May, David did an excellent uh, presentation on the so Harry Crossing Historic Site. Uh, if you happen to miss it and would like to see it, it is on YouTube. Just go to our channel, Canal Society of New Jersey on YouTube. You can subscribe to it and the program meeting is up there uh, to watch. So uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about the Morris Canal. I'm going to give you the story behind it, the history, how it all worked, how it was revolutionary. And at the end of the presentation, I'll give you a little bit of idea of what's available today to see uh, along the, the corridor of the Morris Canal. I know some of you are local, so it'll be very easy for you to see these sites. Some might be more up, uh, upstate New York by the uh, Erie Canal, and you might make you want to take a trip down here to see some of these sites that I'm going to talk about. This the story of the Morris Canal starts with a legend, and this legend dates back from 1822, and this is very early in our country's history. In fact, two of our founding fathers were still alive at this point, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And it was in 1822, it is said, that a prominent Morristown businessman named George McCullough, and if you're familiar with Morristown, you know he has his mansion, McCullough Hall is there, and the legend has that he was fishing on Lake Opaca and when he struck on the idea of building a canal across northern New Jersey, using the lake as a main water source to uh, transport cargo across the state. Now, why was this needed? Well, this long-winded quote of his from 1822, which is a little confusing because it's written in early 19th century ease, um, basically said that there were these large uh, supplies of anthracite coal in Pennsylvania and transporting them to New York City and to other cities in eastern New Jersey like Elizabeth and Newark would be more efficient, more cost effective than either uh, importing them from England, that's what he says when he says Liverpool coal, or for using wood resources which were becoming quickly depleted. So the main uh, focus of the Moores Canal was transporting mostly coal but other goods from Pennsylvania in the west to cities in the east. Now to finance the building of the Morris Canal, a private company was formed, the Morris Canal and Banking Company. It was incorporated in 1824 and it, it sold $100 per share, 20,000 shares were sold providing $2 million of capital. And that was enough to build this canal. I have no idea how much that is in today's dollars, but two million today wouldn't even give you the uh, plans to build it. Now, this successful, the Morris Canal Banking Company successfully funded the building of the canal and kept it going for a hundred years. But it also caused something interesting to happen. It caused Mr. McCullough to totally disassociate himself with the canal. The reason being that he, as a wealthy businessman, a lot of wealthy people believe this back in the days, they didn't like banks and they didn't trust banks. And Mr. McCullough wanted nothing to do with anything that was called the banking company. So ironically, even though he's considered the granddaddy of the Moore's Canal, he came up with the idea, conceptualized it, he really had nothing to do with it 
except from the very beginning. Um, now, from a financial perspective, this was very shrewd of him because except for several years during the 1860s, the canal uh, company actually operated at a loss. <clears throat> the first thing to do logistically was uh, to dam up Lake Opakon and raise the level five feet. Now, if you're familiar with Lake Opakon, it's New Jersey's largest lake. You probably know it as you see it on the right. This is what you would see on a map or a satellite image. That is not what nature gave us. If you look at the 18th century map on the left, you see there's actually two bodies of water. Pacon Pond, also called Great Pond, and a little pond up here actually called Little Pond. When it was dammed and raised, it was created the lake we see on the right, which connected the two bodies of water and created all these coves you see here. Now, you may have heard that Lake of Pacon is a Lenny Lenape word, meaning either Lake of Many Coves or Honey Water of Many Coves. That is absolutely incorrect. First of all, the translation has nothing to do with coves. But secondly, most of these coves you see in today's Lake of Pacon were not around during the native people. They were created 200 years ago when uh, the lake was dammed for the creation of the Morris Canal. And it has only existed that uh, long. So ironically, there's two lakes, Lake Opaca and Lake Mesconecton, which given these native names, you would think they were around from the native time. They were not actually. <clears throat> so November 4th, 1831, the canal opened. Its first trip was between Phillipsburg, which is on the Delaware River here in the west, up to Lake Opaca and then down to Newark and stopped here. It took another five years to create the uh, create the fill in the gap between Newark and Jersey City. So now coal could be transferred from Pennsylvania all the way to New York City. Now, why did it take five years to do that? Well, because of this V here, you probably heard about the Palisades, which is that big cliff face that's on the western shore of the Hudson up in uh, New Jersey into New York. Interestingly, that continues south, but it continues underground. So even though it was, it's completely flat between Newark and Jersey City, you had this underground ledge. So they had to dig around that so they could find a way around the Palisades ledge. And that's why you see this big V that goes almost down to Bayonne uh, on its way to Jersey City. The canal went through six counties and many different towns. Some of you from New Jersey may recognize these towns as places you may have lived or worked at one time. The Morris Canal would become part of the overall canal system in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Now, there were two towpath canals in New Jersey, the Morris, which went across northern New Jersey, and the Delaware and Raritan, which went across central New Jersey between Trenton and New Brunswick, which is right here in the Raritan Bay, why it's called the Delaware and Raritan. Now, coal came mostly from the Poconos down and distributed from Ma Chunk. Ma Chunk today is known as Jim Thorpe. Back then it was a big distribution center. Uh, coal mostly came down through Ravi Railroads to Ma Chunk and then down the Lehigh Canal to Easton. At Easton, the canal boat captain made a decision if he was taking the coal to either New York City or Newark or other cities in the East, he would take the northern route across Moore's Canal. If he was going to either Trenton, New Brunswick, or down to Philadelphia, he would go down the, Pen the Delaware division of the uh, Pennsylvania Canal. Um, he would, if he was heading to Trenton or New Brunswick, he would cross here at uh, uh, New Hope Lambertville. He would come down a feeder, which you don't really see in this map. And then Trenton, and if he was going to New Brunswick across here, Northeast New Jersey. If the boat was continuing on to Philadelphia, he would continue down the Delaware Canal, and then the Delaware River would be navigable at this point and continue down to Philly. Um, coal also came down another canal called the Schuylkill down to Philadelphia. <clears throat> now, there was a huge challenge in creating the Morris Canal, and that's an area known as the New Jersey Highlands. If you're not from New Jersey, you may be surprised to know that the North Western section of the state is very mountainous. In fact, it's a, a part of the Appalachian mountain chain 
that stand, extends all the way from West Virginia to Maine. I live uh, on top of one of these mountains called Schoolies Mountain right here. And if I went, went out of state and said, hi, I'm from New Jersey, I live on top of uh, Appalachian Mountain, they might look at you, me kind of strange, but that's correct. And this was a challenge. Moore's Canal had to climb these mountains getting across the state. And creating a, a mountain climbing canal was never done before. Now, if you look at the numbers at the bottom, you see that Mr. McCullough way, way underestimated uh, the elevation that had to be overcome. He believed there would be a total of about 300 feet that it'd be a pump. When they surveyed it out, the total was actually 1,674 feet. The summit, Lake of Packen, was 914 feet. Then you had another 760 feet to the Delaware Valley, 1,674 feet. So how are they gonna overcome this elevation, these all this huge elevation change? Well, they would do it two ways. The first and the most conventional way, which most people are probably familiar with, is the use of locks. Locks are on most canals and they're good for overcoming slight elevation changes. Very simple, you have the two walls, you have gates on both sides and you have five valves. If you're raising the boat up, you open the valve in the upper part of the lock in the upper canal, let water into the lock and that raises the boat up. You're lowering the boat down, then you let open valves in the lower canal, let the water out and uh, lowers the boat down. Once you have equilibrium, you open the gates and the boat's on the way. On the Moores Canal, there are 23 lift locks. There are also nine guard locks, which over, also overcame some elevation change. So pretty much 32 locks to overcome small changes in elevation. Now, here's a couple historic photos of locks in the Moores Canal. The top one is at Lock 2 Eastern Wardens, one of our favorite images of the Moores Canal. Uh, uh, locks on the Moores Canal, because it pretty much tells the story of a boat going through a lock. It's entered the lock, it's been raised up to the upper level. This is the stern. Um, and everyone is busy in this photo. You got the lock tender here operating the machinery on the gates. You have the mule tender who is left the mules. He's coming forward with his bucket to get some mule feed, because that's when you would typically feed your mules when you're locking through. You have the captain who is opening the mule box, uh, feed box, you give the feed. And then you have these two young ladies here and they cause some debate amongst the Canal Society board. Our, our president likes to think these are the daughters of the cow boat captain and he dropped them off at the village of Warren and they're now waiting to get back on the boat. And others such as myself believe they're just two passerbys who are walking along with the towpath um, after picking up some provisions and they're watching the boat go through. So we'll really never know the answer to those two young ladies. On top of the cap of uh, the cabin of the boat, you see a few things. These are tomatoes that are drying. And this white object, keep that in mind. I'll tell you a little bit later what that is. Uh, the bottom image shows another lock. This is lock one east in Ledgewood. This is actually a work scale, much smaller boat making its way through. And uh, you see the mules there, they're taking a break as the boat is locked through. Um, and this, uh, this photo really shows how much has changed in New Jersey. Very rural area here in Ledgewood. Today, uh, this is a small pocket park. It's surrounded by, you know, lots of development. It's in the armpit of two big highways, Route 10 and Route 46, and it's surrounded by all kinds of strip malls, fast food places, gas station. There's an Outback State House just to the right. So that's how much has changed in the last 100 years. So locks were good for uh, overcoming small, small elevations of about 10 feet. The largest elevation change used by a lock in the Moores Canal was 17 feet. That was in Newark, uh, had the, the, the nickname of deep lock. Um, but there are many much larger elevations on the Moores Canal. Now let's say if you had to overcome an elevation of 90 feet, well, you could do what you see here in this photo, which is use a flight of locks. And I think those of you who are familiar with the Erie Canal know that uh, lock flights were used on the Erie. Um, and they do, do work, you basically stack them up like uh, steps, one lock after another, and both go through, then the next one, then the next one, and so on. Um, but there's a logistical issue here. If it takes about 10 minutes for a boat to get through each lock, 
and you need nine locks to get uh, overcome 90 feet, we're talking about an hour and a half in time to overcome 90 feet in elevation. That's a lot of time. You go down a couple of miles down the uh, canal and hit, say, a 60 foot elevation, that's another hour. So using flights locks is going to add a lot of time to the trip across the state, which already takes five uh, days. Um, so they had to come up with a different idea. Here we see this photo actually is a real flight locks in England uh, on a Avon Canal. 29 locks, 237 feet of elevation actually takes more than five hours to traverse. So with all the large elevation changes on the Moores Canal, this solution wasn't going to work. They needed to come up with a different solution. And they did. And the solution they came up with is the use of inclined planes. Now, incl inclined planes were only used, the only place in the United States where they were used is the Moores Canal. And they were first used on the Moores Canal. That's where they were invented. An inclined plane works very simply by pulling boats up and down a hill, putting the boat in a cradle that rests on a set of rail tracks, and the power to pull the boat up and down a hill is water from the canal. Now, if you look at the original design, we only have drawings because we didn't have cameras back then. It used big wheels like a wheel you'd see on a grist mill. And that worked all right, but it only pulled boats that weighed up to about 20 tons. For the first 10 or 15 years, that was okay. But as soon as you moved into the 1840s, we were now into the Industrial Revolution and the demand for coal and other items greatly grew. You know, factories and other industrial complexes were being built. They really needed to uh, transport more goods. So it was at this point where the Morris Canal was redesigned. It was widened. The locks were made larger, and the inclined planes were totally redesigned to pull much larger and heavier boats. And the way the design worked is it used a Scotch turbine. Now, if you want to, if you've never seen a Scotch turbine, in your lower left, there's a photo of a surviving one. This is a pack on State Park. That's me. You can see, uh, you know, how big it is in, in reference to myself. And that was buried 90, uh, I'm sorry, 40 feet under the ground. And water <clears throat> from the upper canal would come down a big tube called a penstock. And that huge force of water and gravity would turn the Scotch turbine. And that would pull, create the power to pull these boats weighing upwards of 100 tons up and down the inclined plane. The diagram down here shows the schematic of it. Within the powerhouse, there was a huge drum with the cable, sheave wheels, which were basically pulleys on the upper and lower plane were used. And the cable was, uh, turn, the, the power for the cable was through the cable drum, turning using the water power to pull the boats up and down. This is a, a schematic for a double tracked uh, plane which were, there are only three of those uh, on the canal of the 23 um, inclined planes. So here's a couple of historic photos of inclined planes. There are 23 of them in total on the Moyes Canal. They overcame elevations between 30 feet, 33 feet and almost 100 feet, it's the largest, and saved more than 18 hours of time traveling across the state. Now, the upper photo is Plane 7 East in Booton. The boat has just entered the cradle. The cradle goes all the way in the water, so the boat can just float on top of it. Um, it's just starting its journey up the plane. You can see the water line, and it'll be pulled all the way to the top and then floated into the water on the upper part of the uh, canal, the upper canal. Now, a funny story from Booton I'll tell you about. the. You, what was used to pull the cradles were Roblin cable, very, very thick cable. But before that was used, chain was used, and chain often broke. Um, so it became common for boats that were being pulled up the uh, plane to have breakages of the cable and go flying down. And that happened once, once in Booton, where a boat was about three quarters of the way up. The chain broke. The boat very quickly went down. The, plane splashed into the water and actually ended up on a bank over here. 
Well, the problem with that was the captain's wife and kids were in the cabin at the time. So they were very concerned that something happened. So all the men came running up. They asked, are you okay? And it ended up they were okay. But they said to the captain's wife, Madam, that must have been very frightful. And the captain's wife answered and she said, well, I did think it was going rather swiftly, but I just figured that's how the thing worked. So she wasn't phased at all by it, just thought it was part of the process. The lower photo shows a, a captain's eye view going down an inclined plane. This is not a, a cargo boat, it's an inspection boat, much smaller boat, and that's why you see the steering wheel. Uh, canal boats used rudders, but this would be your view if you were going uh, down and playing as the uh, captain. This is playing five east. This is the powerhouse on the left, so that would be where the cable drum would be in the uh, the gears for the inclined plane, and the turbine would be 40 feet below that. So what happened in inclined planes? Well, once they were built, they were considered an engineering marvel and engineers came from all over the world to see them. And you st they started popping up all over Europe. They were used in Japan. Sadly, there are no functioning incline, uh, inclined planes in the United States. They do exist other places though. This one is at the Elbly Canal in Poland. It's still in operation and it's a, a tourist attraction. You can go there, take a tourist boat like this one and ride up and down an inclined plane. So while you can see, uh, inclined planes that still exist in New Jersey, you cannot actually ride one. You'd have to go to your to Poland to to do that. And actually, the gentleman who's the head of this association came over to New Jersey a couple of years ago <clears throat> to view all the inclined planes across the state. He wanted to see where it all began, and he did a very nice program for us at our program meeting. So. For each lock and plane, there was a plane tender. And this was a person and most likely a family who was on call six days a week, sunrise to sunset, to operate both the uh, planes and the locks. And it was uh, typically a family affair. Here you see on the uh, upper photo, this is the daughter of a lock in um, Mount Olive. And the gentleman, this was called Fluke's Lock. Mr. Fluke actually worked on a work scow. So he let his wife and four daughters operate the lock. So it was an all female lock. And, um, you know, husbands, wives, and kids, as soon as they were old enough to operate the machinery, they would operate the locks. And the uh, canal and banking company provided a home, a tender home, the tender's house, like the one you see in the lower photo. This is at Lake Opac on. It's now the Lake of Pathon Historical Museum. So these tenders were on call um, six days a week, sunrise to sunset. And the time of year like this, it would be a very long day, because even though it's seven o'clock, it's still light outside, um, another hour or so to sunset. So while they were on call, they had to go about their duties, do their chores and tender garden or whatever. So the boat captains wanted the tenders to know when they were coming. So if you remember back to that photo of the boat going through a lock, there was a white object on the cabin. Now you can't, see, you can't see me, but what that was was a conch shell. Conch shell like you find at the shore and every captain carried a conch shell. And the reason he did that is if you blow it like this, it makes that sound, that could be heard for up to a half a mile. And as soon as the tender heard that sound, Whoever was available to run down to the lock or into the powerhouse of the plane tender and get ready to bring the boat through. Because time is money and the canal captains do not want to wait. So, as the canal made its cross, uh, way across the state, it pretty much paralleled rivers. It paralleled the Musconetcon in the west, the Rockaway River, the Passaic River, the Pompton River. And there was a reason for this. It was to order to draw water from these rivers as a secondary water source, in addition to Lake Apacon. <clears throat> now, in many places, the canal also crossed rivers. There were two ways that did this river crossing. The most common way was to navigate across it. Since it's a boat, you can take it across the river. But three things were required for river navigation. 
A, you need a dam because you need slack water. You couldn't build a boat against the current. B, you would need a bridge to get the mules and tenders across. Uh, and lastly, you would need uh, guard locks to allow the boats in and out of the um, canal because you had to control the water going into the canal. Too much water in the canal would flood, too little, and it would become too low and the boats would run aground. The top photo you see is at Waterloo Village. The boat actually just came down an inclined plane, plane floor east. The boat's coming out of the cradle now, and the mules are going to about, just about to pull it across the river. Then at the lower uh, photo, you see the guard lock at Waterloo. The boat's now going through the guard lock, and the mules uh, down here, it's, they're hooked up, and they're about to pull the boat out of the guard lock. So this shows the uh, river crossing at um, Waterloo Village. And Waterloo Village later, we can tell you, is a restored village that you can um, visit all this and see what you see here. In fact, you'll see a photo later on um, of this same view of Lock uh, 3 East at Waterloo Village. Looks pretty much the same. The big difference is this is now heavily wooded on the left, where it's open fields here. That's why they needed to build the canal. One of the reasons, anyway, is because of the depletion of wood resources. Now, to navigate a bigger river like the Delaware, there's two places where the boats had to uh, navigate across the Delaware, either, either east into Phillipsburg if they were using the Morris Canal, or New Hope to Lambertville if they were using the DNR. Um, it wasn't practical to build a dam on the Delaware because it's too big and powerful. Um, so, it, and the current was too strong to pull the boats over. Uh, pull the boats across. So the way the boats got across in the Delaware is actually by utilizing that current. They strung a cable across the Delaware. In this case, it would be from east into Phillipsburg. And if they were coming west across, the cable on the uh, New Jersey side would be lower. So the boat would hook to the cable and then ride the current across. If it was going the other way, then the uh, cable on the New Jersey side would be higher than the Pennsylvania side that would drive the current going the other way. This is the Lehigh Canal coming down here. This is the Delaware Canal. So if they were going down to Trenton, they would take this canal down, cross a New Hope. If they were going to the Moores Canal, they would cross here, come up an inclined plane here, and then Phillipsburg, this would be their first stop. Port Delaware was called at Phillipsburg. This is now a park at um, Phillipsburg. You can see the remains in the Concline Plain and this um, rail uh, bridge still exists. Okay, now if the canal ran higher than the, I'm sorry, if the river ran, no, I had it right the first time. If the canal ran higher, higher than the river, and instead of navigation, aqueducts would use. Now, those of you, of course, would involve um, associated with the shore here crossing. No, but aqueducts, that's what your organization is about. And the Shohair Crossing uh, Aqueduct is a pretty impressive one. These are the two biggest, and longest and highest ones in the Moores Canal. The upper one is at Lincoln Park, 275 feet, and it ran between Lincoln Park in Moores County and uh, Mount, uh, Mountain View in um, Passaic County. This uh, aqueduct is totally gone today. If, you visit here, there's um, a park here called Aqueduct Park. You can find a little bit of remains of the abutments, but it's it's totally gone. The one on the bottom is the Little Falls Aqueduct. This was the highest one. It was also the largest man-made structure on the Moores Canal. And this aqueduct, they blew up right after the uh, canal was abandoned. They put a bunch of dynamite in it, blew it up, took several tries. They finally blasted it to smithereens. And we have a, a gentleman who's associated with the Canal Society. His name is Bob Goller. He's currently publishing a book on the abandonment of the Moise Canal. And the cover photo on this novel is the, the uh, aqueduct being blown up. Pretty cool, pretty cool photo. Um, if you go here today, this is a park, Little Falls Moise Canal Park. It's actually a water line that runs right across here, two pipes that go across there. So you can see where this aqueduct was. And, it's it's now water pipes. Okay, so the boats that the Moores Canal used 
were designed specifically for cargo transportation. They were 90% of the boats were cargo holds, very small little cabin in the back here. Uh, tiller, tiller was used to, um, you know, rudder and a tiller was used to steer the boat. Um, and here, interestingly, you see the captain kind of built up the cargo hold to hold more coal. Um, and the boats were hinged. They were two sections, 45 feet in length, about 90 feet total. Now, why would they hinge? And that was because of the use of inclined planes. As the boats came up and over the prow of the plane, they had to be able to bend. If they were one section, they would have broke. So both the boat and the, cave, uh, the cradles were hinged, and that was so they could bend, as you see in this illustration at the bottom. Um, what else was that going to say? And so here we see a, a captain uh, navigating a boat. Um, and then here we see two boats rafting up. Probably this is either they've stopped for the day or it might be Sunday. The canal didn't uh, run on Sunday. And they would often do this raft up together just to socialize with each other while on the canal. Um, the boats were 10 and a half feet. They were 90 feet long, 10 and a half feet wide. And this uh, dimensions were dictated by the locks. The locks were 95 feet by 11 feet. So do the math, they only had six inch clearance, three inches on each side. <clears throat> and you could see how close a tight, uh, how tight a fitter is with this boat in this lock. So this is a very good view of the stern of the uh, canal boat. See the rudder, you see, I'm sorry, you see the tiller and the rudder, there's a rope here. The tiller could be ro ro uh, risen or lowered based on how low the boat is in the water. Loaded boats would be much lower. This is a light boat we see here. Um, very good view of the back cabin, 10 by 10 cabin. I have some uh, port holes here to allow a little extra ventilation. See a number here, 769. That's so the Boys Canal Banking Company can keep track of their boats because you had to pay tolls to go across and they had to keep track of your tonnage and so on. Uh, there's a barrel, barrels were used to store water. Water from the canal was used for washing, uh, for drinking their springs along the canal. Navigation, it took a minimum of two people, the captain who stood at the stern and steered, and then the mule tender, a mule driver, who just kept the mules walking. Here's a mule that tenders over here for some reason. And this is just a really good image of the boat making its way down the canal. <clears throat> and the captain would just kind of lean against the tiller, against uh, the whatever pressure is from the current of the water. Um, and this is why we like to call these boats. A lot of people say call them barges. We always correct them and say, no, there's boats. And that's because they were navigated. They were steered by a captain. So they were canal boats, not barges. Mule tenders were usually a young man, could be as young as eight, 10 years old. <clears throat> Their tender would have to walk 20 miles a day. Um, they were usually someone who was either hired during the summer to uh, work on a canal boat, go along with the canal, or if the canal boat captain had a family, he would employ his kids to be tenders. And it was boys and it was also girls. Here we see a young man, mules hooked up, a boat's being pulled out of the lock. Now, as I uh, mentioned, it could be both young men and, or young ladies who worked as mule tenders. And here are a couple of young ladies who, when they were uh, children, worked as mule tenders. And this is from the boat, Tales the Boatman Told. Now, if you don't, never heard of Jim Lee, um, he was kind of the granddaddy of the whole Moore's, Ta Moore's Canal historical effort. He started, he owned, uh, bought property on one of the Klein Plains, Nine West, and he wrote a bunch of books way back in the 70s. And my favorite is Tales of Boatman Told. This is where he went out and interviewed a bunch of people who lived and worked on the Moore's Canal. They were now older, 80, 90 years old. Back then, they were children. And these are two women who were daughters of canal boat captains and they both worked as mule drivers. Uh, Mrs. Van Horn was the daughter of uh, Captain James Campbell, an African-American canal cap boat captain, and she talked about life in the canal. And this is a direct quote from her interview. Canalers helped one another, 
they were a good kind. They were poor people that had the boats, but they were good to each other. Another in, uh, interview, Isabel Mann was actually another daughter of a canal boat captain. This was Jim Lee's mother-in-law because he was married to the daughter of a canal boat captain uh, or granddaughter of a canal boat captain. And this is her quote. When asked about a mule that died along the way, she said they borrowed one from Mr. Jim Campbell. So the man's or the Lenstroms borrowed a, a, a mule from the Van Horn, from Mrs. Van Horn's family, Campbell family, when uh, a mule died. So this was how the canalers all helped each other out and kind of created this extended family along the canal. Okay, so this photo, more than anything else, shows what life on a canal boat would be like. It was nine months out of the year. The canal boats ran any month when the canal wasn't frozen. And what we see here is um, a woman's frying uh, dinner up in a pan. The, the captain is back here steering the canal boat. The woman's frying something up. There's an open stove here. Uh, there's a pot here with some water. She probably boiled water either for cooking or doing wash, and here's some linen drying on the uh, feed boxes. Um, she's standing in a section between, this is called the hinges, between the two uh, sections of the canal boat. And um, that's where the most deck space was. Uh, the cabin was very small, so if you didn't have to spend time down there, if you, the weather was nice, you did most things up on the deck, cooking, cleaning, uh, any other chores you had. So this was pretty much life on a canal boat nine, nine months out of the year. Okay, typically captains rented the canal boats from the Moore's Canal Banking Company. That's why you saw the numbers so that you keep track of the, of the boats. And they were responsible for the upkeep. Now what we're seeing here is a repair is made to, made to a, the hull of the boat while it's on the cradle of a, 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 of a inclined plane. So the canal, the inclined plane cradle could be used as a dry dock to make these repairs. You would just ask the tender to stop the uh, cradle on the plane, and um, that's how you could plug up a leak. So the mule driver is making the repair, the captain's watching, and the mules are getting some uh, lunch while this is being done. So. Um, Although the captain rented the boats, he had to provide the mules. So if you wanted to be a canal boat captain, you had to buy a, a team of mules. A team of mules cost about $150, which would have been an exorbitant amount of money for a canal boat captain. Um, so you had to save up the money to buy your team, and you took great, great care of them because this was your livelihood, and you also judged by other captains and how well you kept your mule. <laughs> so here we see it. Uh, this is not on the Moore's Canal, but you see a captain very proudly showing off his team of mules. And if you were the mule tender, this would be your job is to take care of the mules. Mules did not uh, stay on the canal boats. They uh, stay in stables. There were stables provided by the Moore's Canal Bank Company all up and down the canal. And that's where they, they spent the night. Okay, so the canal boats had no refrigeration, very little storage. So if you were set out for a 10-day canal trip, you cannot buy all your provisions. You had to get them on a daily basis. And because of this, there were canal stores all up and down the canals. They were privately owned enterprises. Um, the people open these to, to sell goods to the canal uh, to the canalers. Here too, we see this is the Smith store in Waterloo and the Perry store in Port Murray. These are two buildings that survive architecturally look exact same today. The Waterloo Canal store, Smith store is a museum today, Waterloo vi Village. The Perry store is actually a private business, Port Murray, it's a woodworking shop, I believe, and one of the few existing businesses that were former canal stores. And you can see there, a lot of them were located right on the banks of the canal, so you can pull the bank of the boat right up there to load the goods right in. So kind of like a drive-through is today. There's another canal store. This is the Kingston Ledgewood, also preserved as a museum. And this is the current interior, how they um, set it up. And it, it's a great view because it shows not only that these canal stores were general stores that sold a little bit of everything, 
but it shows that they were great gathering places. They had this pot belly stove in the middle, and you just imagine all the canal captains all gathering around there with smoking their pipes and drinking their coffee and catching up on things. This story was uh, located right across the street from a basin at the foot of two planes, playing two east and three east, uh, right, um, right after each other, very close together. So you can imagine westward heading boats, there would probably be a wait here. So it was a very strategic place to build a canal stone. That's where the stories we usually were, is by locks or inclined planes, where they kind of had a captive audience. Okay, I missed a slide here somehow. There we go. Okay, so what happened to the Morris Canal? Well, as this picture uh, indicates, it was put out of business by the railroad. Uh, canal boats took five days to get across the state. Uh, train can make in about five hours. A uh, locomotive pulling 30 coal cars would pull the equivalent of about 10 canal boats. So it was a foregone conclusion from about 1860s on that the railroad would eventually take over the canal business. It wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. Um, but in the latter days of the canal, which most of these photos taken from late 1900s, early 20th century, the canal and the railroad uh, worked in conjunction with each other, partially to uh, transport cargo, but also to transport other things like people. Now, what we're seeing here is this is at the Lake of Pacon station, <clears throat> and we're seeing steam launches here owned by a company called the Black Line. And at this point now, Lake of Pacon had become a big resort place. So vacationers coming into the train station had to be transported to the resorts around the lakes. The roads were very bad, so they actually used the canal. And as the train brought in people, they got on the boats and they would go up the canal to the feeder canal and then up and through uh, into Lake Opac and into the various resorts. And the black line was actually uh, part of two competing lines. The, the white line, the black line, the black line used the Moores Canal, the white line did not. So it was very, um, very fierce competition. And so if you took the black line, if you had to just walk across the uh, platform of the station, if you took the white line, you had to kind of go up the stairs and across the street to the wharf. Um, but the reason people want, preferred taking the white line as opposed to the black line was because the black line, you had to go through the lock to get into Lake Opacon. Now for a canal boat captain, that was just another day going through the lock. For a vacationer, it was kind of a very scary experience. So what I want to read you today, right now, is an 1890 account. And this was a journalist, his name was Gustav Colby, um, this was published in a newspaper and later in a book. And this was his firsthand uh, experience going through this lock, the lock and this little uh, launch. And this is it verbatim. The passage through the lock is an interesting experience. The lower gates are open, the miniature steamer glides into the lock, the gates closing behind it. It is now imprisoned in a narrow passage. On either side are high dripping walls and in front and the stern of the closed gates. There is a sudden roar of rushing, surging water. The launch lunges half forward, half upward, and a screw adds to the turmoil. The lunging continues, the swashing, surging water, now lifting the launch by the stern and by the prow. The actions of those who have not been through the lock before is a study. The babies cry, the women grab the nearest man by the arm, the girls are prettily flustered, the men endeavor to appear calm, the passengers who have made the passage before look amused and the only persons absolutely indifferent are the captain and engineer. So that's a first-hand account of what it would be like going through this lock um, on the way to Lake Opac on resort. So the canal, unlike other canals, uh, Moist Canal is completely abandoned. It doesn't exist and there's only water in very small sections. And the person more than anyone else, one person who led the abandonment was a man named Hudson Maxim. And he was a very wealthy landowner on the western shores of Lake Opacon. And his fear was that Lake Opacon would be used by, as a water source to provide the canal, or the canal would be used as a water source and Lake Opacon would be providing the water and the water would be depleted. So he very vehemently led the abandonment effort um, 
ran a commission and wrote lots of reports of why the canal should be abandoned. And it was. And here's Mr. Maxim here. Here's his uh, boathouse, just to give you an idea of his wealth. That's his, his boathouse. And so very interestingly, we always like to say, or I like to say, the Moore's Canal was born and died on the Lake of Pacon. Mr. Uh, McCullough was fishing on Lake of Pacon when he conceived the idea. And Mr. Maxim, who lived on Lake of Pacon, was forefront in killing, yeah, killing the canal. So that's the story of the Moyes Canal. Now I'm just going to very briefly tell you about what you can see today. Um, the Moyes Canal Greenway is an effort to, first of all, recreate, not recreate, but uncover what's left of the canal, uncover the artifacts, restore what's left of the canal, and provide education for the canal, such as what I'm doing tonight. And it's a collaborative effort. Many municipalities across state counties, state, many organizations are all involved in this effort. And this just shows you what you can see uh, across the Canal Greenway. If you're local, these are sites you can see. If you're up, up New York State or other areas, you might want to make a trip down to see some of these sites. Now, first of all, most of the canal is no longer water. There are just a few sites that have some water in it. Uh, here are two sites, Wharton's U Forest Park and Waterloo Village. Waterloo Village um, is the one location on a canal that's a totally preserved canal town, if you're not familiar with Waterloo. These are the only two places where we run our canal boats. This is the Canal Society's Canal Explorer. You run the little canal tours on the water. <laughs> there are also some locks. Lock 2 East of Wharton is the only totally um, restored lock. It was restored just a few years ago, opened up. Um, they're now restoring the tender's house, which you can see the remains over on the right here. So that's gonna be a visitor center, that's real cool. And here's Lock 3 West at uh, Waterloo Village. Now, if you remember back from the photo I showed you at Waterloo with the boat going through the lock, this is the same site today. And the big difference, you got the lock there, there's Smith's story still there, the canal's still there. Big difference, this is all thick woods now, used to be open fields. And Klein Plains are the two of the best. Plain two east and Ledgewood, open to the public. Here's the plain, these are what are called sleeper stones. They held the rails. This is um, the structures, you can look down into the turbine chamber. This is where the powerhouse would be and you could see where the turbine was. This is the bypass flue and this is where the water exited the turbine changer, chamber and bypassed the plane. Now the chamber is empty uh, today, but a short drive will take you to Pack on State Park where you can see that large turbine you saw in the uh, earlier photo. This is another plane nine west, um, is another great plane to visit. This is Jim Lee I told you about. This is his house where he raised his family. It was a plane tender's house. Now it's the Jim and Mary Lee Museum. They're not doing tours now because of COVID, but when you do tours, you can actually walk into the chamber and there the turbine is intact. Canal stores, we, I talked about these earlier. Uh, King Story and Smith Story in Waterloo were ones at a museum and can be visited. Uh, greenway trails, lots of greenway trails all across the state, um, which are just great places to hike, go for a hike and see parts of the canal that are no longer water. This is Kuiper's Park in Hackettstown. I was there just there this morning trimming back some of the uh, branches. And Alamucci Trail, just this last week, we opened this up officially because we just uh, put in a new uh, footbridge across this gorge. This is one of the longer sections, almost five miles between Hackettstown and Waterloo Village. Great trail to hike. Moore's Canal Boats. Now, I told you how a Moore's Canal Boat uh, worked, what it looked like. If you want to see a full-size replica, Redlock Park in Moore's, in Moore's County on Route 57. This was uh, built by a group called the Highlands Coalition, Coalition, which was a group of teenagers. They built a full-size uh, Moore's Canal Boat. You can walk on the deck. You can pretend play captain and move the tiller around and even go down into the little 10 by 10 cabin that you see down here. 
where they live, just two bunks and some storage, and that's pretty much it. This is out in the open, so you could visit any day, sunrise to sunset, no appointment or anything necessary. And if you want to see a real Morris Canal boat, this is our exhibit, Waterloo Village. This was called the, the Highlands Boat. It was found in Highlands, New Jersey, which is an area down by the shore. As strange as it sounds, it was found under a house. They're raising the house down and put, uh, hey, raising the house up, put stilts on it, and the boat was found underneath it. It was being used as a foundation. Um, we talked them into donating the, the Canal Society. We had to cut it up to get it under the house, and it was brought up to Waterloo. It's now an exhibit up in Waterloo Village. Uh, there's the bow section. Now, we don't know what programming we'll be able to have at Waterloo this season. Hopefully, we'll be able to open this, this exhibit. We do know we will be having a canal day on September 18th, so we'll be available then. So if you want to see this, um, definitely put it on your calendar September 18th, and you'll be able to see this exhibit. We just, by the way, last week um, bought a canal boat stove <laughs> that we're going to have in, in this exhibit. So you'll be able to see an actual stove that was used on a canal boat for a couple. So that's my presentation. I'll turn it over to questions in just a second. So let me tell you about the um, how to contact me. There's my email address. Um, if you have any questions, anything you want to let me know, feel free to contact me. We have our website. Now I showed you all these great um, walking tours and stuff. Just recently, we uploaded a bunch of walking uh, brochures to our website. You can get there from the home page. So if you want to come out and check out these sites, check out uh, the locks and the uh, canal stories and all the great walking paths. There are brochures on our site all across the state. Um, if you do Facebook, we have our Facebook group, and we always have, always tell you what's going on Facebook. Any event either we're doing or in any way related to the canal or other canals, we'll post it on Facebook. So that's it, and I will open up for questions. David, I guess, will you read me the questions? Yeah, so, so thank you very much. And uh, for those of you that are on here and want to pose some questions in the chat, uh, I will pass this along. Uh, that works. I find that works really well um, for uh, for the purposes of using the video later. Uh, if I ask a question, then it's a little bit more clear, and then you can answer it versus you know you pulling it off the screen yourself. And if you leave this screen right up, people can write down that contact information. Uh, I put the link uh, for Canal Society New Jersey org as well as a Facebook page in the chat as well. So you can go to the chat section, leave a question, check out the links that I provided in there. Um, and while you're you're doing that, I, I made a couple of notes here, so I was kind of hoping to, to provide a, a few moments for people to put their uh, questions in. Um, and so I, I just made a few notes, too, that uh, you mentioned um, Jim Thorpe, uh, which I happened to come across that pleasant little town um, completely by accident. We stayed there for a couple hours, had a nice picnic. It's a beautiful location, and I hope to go back. Um, uh, you have these great images, uh, particularly the one that you'd mentioned. Uh, with the two girls at the lock, and uh, I I find it really interesting and and great that there's some debate within the society of uh, what those two young women are are doing next to that lock, uh, whether they're uh, related to the captain or they're just passing by. Um, but I I would tend to think that they're they're out there selling goods to whatever canal boats locked through a sort of a captive audience, much like the canal store. Maybe they were able to sell some eggs to the captain or or something to that effect. Um, that's how I would interpret it, and, and I would add that to your list of controversy amongst the society. Sounds uh, good. See. That's as <laughs> good a good a guess as I think. <laughs> and uh, you know, I I I yeah, really like the with the the replica boat and how you can go in and plan that. I had uh, many many times as a child. I spent countless amounts of hours playing with other uh, other kids similar to my age and family. Just down the road from where I grew up, there was somebody who had built uh, just a little fake boat with two trees that grew through it for like the sail mass just down the road. And and the neighborhood kids, we'd, we'd basically go pay, play um, pirate on it. Um, so that's basically what I could imagine myself doing even as an adult if I was to visit that. Let's see, there are a couple of questions here, so I'm going to pose those to you. Okay, sounds uh, good. All right. Um, 
And there's a question here, pull rope posts in the bow, why? That comes from Chester. Pull rope posts in the, oh, the, the posts in the, those were what the tow rope, the tow line went through um, to go to the mules. If it was a, a light boat, meaning unloaded, the, the boat was pulled from the bow. If it was a loaded boat, it was pulled from the midships in the center of the boat. So if you look at photos of canal boats, you'll see those posts with a little fork at the end. That's where the tow line went through to kind of guide the uh, line to the mules. And, and one more thing um, I'll say before we, we go um, to the next question. You mentioned, David, about the great photos. That's another thing we have on our website, and um, that's fairly recent. If you go to our website, we do have a photo gallery of both the Morris Canal and the DNR Canal, um, but we have you know, lots, many, many photos of the Morris Canal across the state. So if you did like the historic photos on this group, um, on this presentation, you can see more on our website. Great, and, and there's actually a few comments here thanking you. Uh, excellent slides and maps. It gets better every time. That comes from R. Um, we have a comment coming in from Tim. Who says hi to myself and Derek, who I saw was joining us as well, Derek in the Erie Canal Museum. Uh, and he's welcome. He's saying hi from Hagerstown, home of the 2021 World Canals Conference. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that in September myself going down there. Um, but Tim asks of Tim, who was the engineer who designed the inclined planes? Uh, oh gosh, I don't, I don't have his name off the top of my head. I, I, sh I should know that. Um, it's uh, Ephraim something or other. I, I don't know, but that I, that I should, I should have that name. I'll have it in, 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 in uh, subsequent uh, presentation because that's a great question. Very good. And yeah, there, yeah, somebody just put out Ephraim, Ephraim Beach. Thank you. Very good. I, nice. I couldn't pull it up. And uh, that, that happens to me quite a bit. Uh, actually, it, if I wasn't asked the question, I could come up with it. But yeah, since I was formed the question. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see. Chester's asking Delaware and Hudson Canal boats also use conch shells. Uh, did all canalers? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I've heard when I give this presentation to other canal groups, usually they say, yeah, they used them um, on air canals too. So it's not something that's. Uh, specific to the Moyes Canal, it's just it was common used as a way to signal tenders. As we and, and since this was brought up about the DNH Canal, I was I, I had a little note here. Of, do you know if there was what to what level of the competition, particularly for that anthracite coal uh, coming out of Pennsylvania? I mean, was it just a matter of depending on where the destination was, or was there actually like a pretty good rivalry between, let's say, the Morris or uh, the DNH, so far as uh, shipping out that that coal? I. Think it. I mean, I think it's just like a roadway today. You take whatever is the most efficient, efficient and logical route. So, um, you know, there might have been competition, but it's a matter of like, well, do I take the parkway? Or do I take the turnpike? Where am I going? So, you know, I think that's more the. See, I, I would have. If you go, you know, in New Jersey, if you go in New York City, you take the Moyes Canal. If you go into Trenton, New Brunswick, you take the uh, Delaware and Vernon. Yeah, I would conjecture the same. I'm just glad I'm not the only one that thinks that way. Um, so uh, there's another question coming in. Uh, how can anyone obtain higher resolution images from the Canal Society's collection? Uh, so you would mentioned that a lot of them up are, are up on the Canal Society of New Jersey.org website. Uh, if somebody was seeking them for use in another way, uh, seeking a higher resolution, is there a way to do that? Yeah, just uh, send me an email. I could probably... I can get you a, a PDF with a higher resolution. It, well, it depends. It depends on the photo. Some we have, some we don't. You'd have to um, ask me for the specific one. I can tell you which if we have a higher resolution. And all, and you know any photo, by the way, um, that's on the website. You just right right click and you can download it. So. Okay. And of course, if uh, just like anything, if it's coming from somebody's collection, it's always appropriate to cite that source. Uh, even if you're posting up on Facebook and promotion of something, it's always good to let people know where you got it from. Correct. Uh, um, let's see, Mary Beth is asking if there was much collaboration or assistance from Europe when the US was making their canals. 
I'm sorry, collaboration from what? Or assistance from Europe, different uh, European oh, from Europe. Europe. Uh, actually, it's it's the opposite. Europe, um, European countries learn from us because uh, we, the Boris Canal, you know, invented the whole concept of the inclined plane. Um, so, unlike in most things where we, you know, inherited it from Europe, um, this is one thing we kind of gave Europe was the the inclined plane. And, it was revolutionary. I heard that, you know, engineers from all over the world came to the Moyes Canal to say, how did they do that? How did they build a canal that climbed mountains? That was, you know, unheard of before. So, yeah, it was, it was more, more than that. But there was, um, you know, I, I'm not a money guy, so I don't get into the finances, but there was, there is some story behind the finances, financing and how money uh, from the Netherlands were used to finance it. And so on. So there was, yes, yeah, some financial collaboration, but I, I don't have real a lot of details on it. Right, and and a lot of that area, the 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 Dutch were heavy uh, in banking globally. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so there's a lot of projects that you might not think of that the money itself actually came from from a foreign bank even 200 years ago. Right. Um, a little bit less of the ones and zeros that are in the computer systems of today. But um, so Tim is asking if Tim. Uh, what were the working years of the Morris Canal? Uh, well, so the first trip was 1831. The last cargo boats ran, I, I keep, I, I used to say 1910, then I keep finding photos where they're a little bit farther. So I pushed up to like the 19 teens, like 1913 was the last year you'd see probably, or last around the last time you'd see a cargo boat. Then the canal hung around for another 10 years when they were trying to decide what to do with it. Now, for those 10 years, the only boats would be either maintenance scows, because they had to continue doing work on the canal to maintain it, and inspection boats. There is a, a very a pretty inspection boat called the Katie Kelly. You see lots of photos of it. And these were Moore's Canal, or canal, Moore's Canal Banking Company officials inspecting the canal. Other than that, the only boats you would see on the canal were pleasure crafts, rowboats, canoes, you'd see swimmers, you'd see ice um, skaters. But, the, you know, as far as um, transporting cargo, I don't think that uh, ended any later than uh, 19 teens. Although the, the canal is considered 100 years, um, you know, 1820s to 1920s from its inception to the abandonment. The best book, by the way, anyone who's really, really, really interested in getting the detail, 100 Years, 100 Miles by Barbara Collada is the definitive book on I mean, it. It was written back in the 80s. Oh, that's, that's great. Uh, I think I'll ask um, one more question uh, from the chat. And, and then uh, if you don't mind, I have a, one little question for myself before we wrap up. Sure. But John, John, who's asking, and John's actually uh, part of our Friends of Schoharie Crossing um, group. So there's a shameless plug about the Francis Square Cross. <laughs> okay. uh, it's a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, but he's basically asking how you became interested in canals. Okay. Well, first of all, I, I always had an interest in local history. And I've always had an interest in boat. My father was a boatman. So I was on the water um, from the time growing up. And I grew up in uh, northern New Jersey, lived, you know, many places across northern New Jersey. So the idea that there was once a navigable uh, waterway across these towns in this area I'm so familiar with was just absolutely fascinating to me. And that's what that fascination I want to bring uh, to other people because I've seen people, I've you know, met people who've lived in a certain town for 10 years and said, you're telling me there's a canal that went right through this town? Like people actually rode boats through this town? Because since the canal was abandoned, you would have no idea unless you know the history. And when I finally got to the point, and this was only within the last 10 years where I followed the canal all across the state, all these areas I was familiar with and knew, you know, right, you know, very well. Suddenly I said, wow, I didn't know I had a canal going through here. And there was two places I lived, Booton and um, Rockaway, where I lived in places, one was run right across the street from the canal, one was just a block, you know, the canal ran just a block behind the house. I had no idea until I followed the actual path of the canal that 
it existed so close. <laughs> so that was kind of the fascination with me. And and what I find interesting is just how much that really kind of parallels a lot of the stuff we see, uh, particularly the Mohawk Valley, um, but also along the entire canal way of the Erie Canal across New York State. Um, but because in the Mohawk Valley, it's a canalized Mohawk River now, a lot of the historic sections uh, have otherwise been lost or people just seem to forget because it's been 100 years since it was in operation there um, as that version of that canal. So um, that, in, in your response to that question, you kind of rolled up and packaged into uh, a much better way than, than the question I had for you. So you already kind of answered that for me. And I think that was a little bit more eloquent than ending on on me asking a kind of a redundant question at that point. And I, I want to thank you so much for this presentation. I learned a lot. I took some notes, uh, had some uh, additional little questions that were also brought up. Um, I'm glad I'm not the only one that noticed the, the dog in the image uh, with the, the handle <laughs> being repaired, um, which, which, you know, another shameless, shameless self with, uh, uh, you know, selfish plug is that there was a program I did with the Arkell uh, featuring paintings and other art over the Erie Canal and, and one of those, uh, the video is up on YouTube, so there's the shameless plug part, but there's actually a painting that gets used quite a bit for the Erie Canal. Uh, but until you see the entirety of the painting, you often don't realize that there's actually within that a gentleman urinating on the side of a building. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny when I I say different things a little bit differently with each presentation. Sometimes with that panel, I'll say everyone in this picture is busy, including the dog. And that, you know, there, there's that little bit of difference of doing it online. If you're in a room, you can kind of judge people's reaction once the image goes up. Yes. But uh, but I, I was glad that that was brought up in the chat and uh, it makes for a, a really, like you said, it's a, it's a busy image. Yes, and uh, uh, Tim, I, I want to thank you very much. I want to thank the Canal Society of New Jersey. It was an honor to give a presentation for you and it's been a real privilege and honor to have you present for Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site. Well, it was and my also, honor, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much to everybody that's also joined in. Uh, if you like this presentation, please let us know. And if you really liked it, please share the YouTube video later when I post it on our Facebook, and I'll tag in the Canal Society in New Jersey. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Stay safe, stay well.